Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Laszlo Montgomery here, the China History Podcast, episode 223, part six of our set course meal intro to the history of poetry in the Tang Dynasty. Even without getting into any of the minutia of poetry appreciation and poem styles, imagery, and composition, here we are, six episodes into this overview of Tang poetry. And we only just finished the Ronaldo and Messi of the era. And, well, as with European football, where Tang poetry is concerned, there's a lot more to it than Li Bai and Du Fu. In Tang poetry, or even all of Chinese poetry, some might say, we know Li Bai and Du Fu enjoy such a special status. It seems that all the other beloved poets end up looking like also rans compared to them. But everyone who is really familiar with Chinese poetry, eh, they don't fall for any of that stuff. They know every age produced its own marvels and wonders. And who's to say this one by Su Shi or Gao Qi is any better or worse than that one composed by Du Fu? I thought from here on out, why don't we run through some of the other famous names from Tang poetry? And if you're not familiar with these poets yet, now's your chance. Where Tang poetry is concerned, when asked, who were the top three? Pretty much Wang Wei always rounds out that list. Some might say Meng Hao Ran or Bai Ju Yi, but Li Bai, Du Fu, and Wang Wei, that was almost always the three names you hear. They were the revered trinity of high Tang poetry. Li Bai had a Taoist bent to his character, Du Fu was the Confucianist, and Wang Wei, he channeled Chan Buddhism in his work. His lifelong devotion to Buddhism had quite an impact on not just his life, but his poems and paintings as well. Up until the Wuzong Emperor crashed the party in 845, Buddhism flourished in the Tang like never before and was reflected in many aspects of Chinese culture. That Wang Wei was so devout and all, it isn't surprising given the times he lived in. Wang Wei and Li Bai's years on this earth were almost the same. The most reliable records we have say they were both born in the year 701, although that's disputed, and for good reason. It was the time period when Wu Zetian was reigning as empress of her very own Zhou dynasty. Li Bai died in 762 and Wang Wei in 761. Wang Wei was not only one of the most beloved of Tang poets, he was also a painter and a musician. His instrument that earned him this renown was the pipa. It's a four-stringed, lute-like, sort of pear-shaped, plucked instrument. If you search for Liu De Hai on Spotify, you could listen to one of modern China's greatest pipa players. That's all I've been listening to since I began work on this episode. Now, before we get to his poetry and painting, let's look at Wang Wei's early life. He came from a good family who lived in Shanxi. He was born in that most ancient part of China, on the Yellow River, about halfway between Chang'an and Luoyang. His father was an official of middling rank who continued the tradition in the Wang family of serving the dynasty. Wang Wei's mother came from a Substantial family, so to put it mildly, he had it made growing up. It's said he was one of those child prodigies who everyone knew was destined for all kinds of great things. At age 15, he was sent to Luoyang and Chang'an to start training for the Jin Shi exams that guaranteed you a favorable spot in the civil service. He was a he was a huge hit, the boy wonder, who sure played a mean peepa. He passed the exams at 721. Thousands like him took the exam at the same time. Only 38 passed. And Wang Wei, he had the top score. So, you get the picture. No ordinary struggling youth who needed a few tries to pass the exam. With the prestige earned from such a fine showing in the Jin Shi exams, plus the benefit of coming from the kind of family he did with influential friends in high places, Wang Wei didn't do too bad in his career. 
Uh, he had a couple of bumps in the road here and there, but he had some halfway decent postings, both in Chang'an and in Shandong province. His career in the government didn't have as many potholes and disappointments as Du Fu and some of the other great poets we'll get to later. In 731, his wife passed away, and he never remarried, and he left behind more than a few poems where he reflected on this loss and the sadness he felt. A few years later, in 734, he was appointed to be Emperor Xuanzong's Reminder on the Right. This, by the way, was the same job that Du Fu had when he worked at the Imperial Palace. The Yo Shi Yi, the Reminder to the Right, they had right and left. Not a high-ranking position, but they were charged with catching all the balls that dropped and reminding the Imperial Court about certain overlooked matters. He had to navigate around Li Lin Fu, just like Du Fu had to. Xuanzong's powerful and suspicious chancellor was not an easy boss to have. As an official in the Tang government, eh, Wang Wei did well. Between his government salary and the sales of his paintings, he had a nice easy life. As a musician, he had already made a name for himself in the capital. In painting, however, he was an innovator, and he's credited with being one of the earliest to introduce landscape painting. Shan Shui Hua. Landscape painting. It began in the Six Dynasties period, but really came of age during the Tang, like so many other great things about Chinese culture. Wang Wei, I doubt he was the first, but he was certainly one of the most celebrated. The monochrome Shui Mo style that used one color of ink is what Wang Wei is remembered for. He was both a developer of this style of painting and one of its earliest masters. The Po Mo, or broken ink, or splashed ink method of ink brush painting was what Wang Wei is particularly remembered for. And like Wang Xijir's calligraphy, None of Wang Wei's paintings survive to our day. But thanks to the early Chinese tradition of imitating and faithfully copying the masters, we have an idea what his painting looked like. In Japanese culture, they also loved this broken ink style of painting, too. It's called haboku in Japanese. You know, all these wenren, or literati from these times, from more than a thousand years ago? This was all part of their skill set. Poetry, painting, calligraphy, music, the game of Go or Wei Qi. Everyone who had a classical education can do all these things. But some mastered it more than others or were particularly talented and innovative. This type of monochromatic painting that Wang Wei helped pioneer is called the Southern School. These Early painters didn't call themselves that. Southern school was a term that was applied to this style much later on in the 17th century. This southern school, or Nanzong Hua, also became known as literati painting, Wenren Hua. Like more than a few things that came out of the Tang Dynasty, this style was enthusiastically and wholeheartedly embraced in the Song and carried to even further heights. Wang Wei continued his career in the civil service, based in Chang'an, and that's where he was serving when, in 756, the city was seized by the rebels, led by An Lushan. Wang was among those captured and marched to Luoyang. There he languished till the city was retaken by imperial troops in 758. Now, according to the Wang Wei legend, passed down to our time, he didn't escape in four months like Du Fu did, but, like the poet Sage, he too remained true to the Tang Emperor, and whilst in captivity, he dragged his feet in the service of the rebels, even feigning deafness to avoid having to be useful to them. And when it was all over and Wang Wei was released, attempts were made by his political rivals to brand him a traitor for serving the rebels. Thankfully for Wang Wei, he had also written a poem during his time of captivity that clearly showed, despite being in the hands of the rebels, he never lost his patriotism or loyalty towards the Tang royal house. One other thing in his favor, after he was released, was the support he got from his brother, who was higher up in the Tang civil bureaucracy totem pole, and used his influence to get Wang Wei off easy and keep his political rivals at bay. 
Towards the end of his life, in the last years of the Anlushan Rebellion, he retired to his nice country estate on the Wangchuan River, east of present-day Xi'an in the town of Lantian. And there, in his final years, he wrote some of his best poetry. I'm sure he found time for painting as well. It was said he had quite a nice scholar's residence and indulged in all his passions in this perfect environment, including his strong embrace of Chan Buddhism. The Song Dynasty heavyweight champion in all matters cultural, the great Su Shi, said of Wang Wei, quote, Taste Wang Wei's poetry. There are paintings in it. Look at his paintings. They are full of poetry. End quote. He's remembered for both. One of the most celebrated landscape paintings in the Southern School style was Wang Wei's depiction of his villa on the Wangchuan River. And as I said, nothing done in Wang Wei's own hand exists, but this work was copied quite often, and we can see it today. How close this comes to the Wang Wei original, we can't say, though. The theme of these early literati paintings were usually landscapes, all monochromatic with some accompanying calligraphy, always a poem. Throughout Chinese history, there were others who were particularly noted for this shan shui, landscape-style painting. The Southern School wasn't as concerned about capturing the landscape in any realistic form. Instead, the artist interpreted themselves what they saw and allowed for all kinds of freedoms of expression to depict the scene they were painting. Wang Wei's tomb was located along the banks of the Wangchuan River south of Lantian. According to what I was able to find out, parts of his tomb were either given a once-over during the Cultural Revolution and or utilized in the construction of the Xiangyang No. 14 factory. If you ever find yourself in or around Lantian, go check it out. It looks like they spiffed up the gravestone in 2008 that simply says Wang Wei Mu, the tomb of Wang Wei. It's located right in front of a 1,300-year-old ginkgo tree that claims to have been planted by Wang Wei himself. I saw the photo and I thought, man, what a sorry-looking monument this is. So depressing, you know, given Wang Wei's stature and all. But then I considered all those thousands of years of Chinese history and concluded, well, you can't turn every historical relic into a shining tourist attraction. Wang Wei lovers, next time you're in Xi'an, his tomb is about an hour southeast of the city. Let's groove on a few of Wang Wei's poems. He only left behind about 400. I think I may have mentioned last episode, Wang Wei weighed in at a very respectable 29 poems that made it into the Tang Shi San Bai Shou, the 300 Tang poems. Only Li Bai and Du Fu had more. Here's one of Wang Wei's most famous poems. It's only four lines, five characters per line, 20 characters. He wrote this after he left his government post and retired to his riverside villa. You could feel Wang Wei's loneliness and exhaustion trying to survive those terrible post on Lushan years. It's called Deer Park or the Deer Enclosure. Lu Chai. Kong Shan Bu Jian Ren Dan Wen Ren Yu Xiang Fan Jing Ru Shan Lin Fu Zhao Qing Tai Shang. On this lonely mountain, I see no one, yet I hear the echo of voices. Rays of sunlight enter into the deep forest, shining once more upon the green moss. Here's another rather well known Wang Wei poem. This one's six lines rather than the usual four or eight, but five characters per line. This is a Wu Yan Gu Shi, a five character poem. In the Ancient Style. It's one of a couple poems by Wang Wei titled Farewell, Song Bie, Xia Ma, Yin Jun Jiu, Wen Jun, He Suo Zhi, Jun Yan, Bu De Yi, Gui Wo, Nan Shan Chui, Dan Chu, Mo Fu Wen, Bai Yun, Wu Jin Shi. Dismount, and we'll take a drink together. Where are you off to? You say you failed, retiring, 
to the foot of the southern mountains. Well, go, and no more questions. For the white clouds, there'll never be an end. Here's another one of Wang Wei's more famous poems, this time expressing loneliness and isolation rather than saying farewell. This one is called On the Mountain Holiday, Thinking of My Brothers in Shandong. All alone in a foreign land. I am twice as homesick on this day. When brothers carry dogwood up the mountain each of them a branch, and my branch missing. And uh, one more famous Wang Wei poem. This one's called Yearning, Xiang Si. Hong Dou Sheng Nan Guo, Chun Lai Fa Ji Zhi, Yuan Jun Duo Cai Xie, Ci Wu Zui Xiang Si. Those red beans of the south flush on the branches in the spring. Take home an armful, for my sake, as a symbol of our love. Though Li Bai and Du Fu collectively seem to define Tang poetry, Wang Wei is still mentioned in the same breath. But there were more poets than just those three. One last poet I'd like to introduce from this Hai Tang, Sheng Tang period was Meng Hao Ran. And coming in at 15 poems that made it to the Tang Shi San Bai Shou, he, too, is considered one of the more celebrated poets of the Tang. Meng was the eldest between the three poets I already introduced. He lived from about 690 to 740. He had about 10 years on Li Bai and 20 years on Du Fu. So he was borderline early to high Tang. Do you remember in part four when I read the Li Bai poem, Huang He Lo Song Meng Hao Ran Zhi Guang Ling? sending off Meng Hao Ran at Yellow Crane Tower. Li Bai was standing high above the Yangtze River in that same exquisite tower you could visit today, though it's not in the same location it was in the 8th century. And from the heights of this tower, Li Bai watched Meng Hao Ran sail his lonely vessel away down the Yangtze. And Li Bai wrote a poem in this genre that spawned who knows how many poems throughout the ages, expressing one's emotions at the departure of someone they cared about. Huang He Lo is in Wuhan, Hubei province. This is the land that lays claim to Meng Haoran. His family traced their ancient lineage all the way back to Mengzi himself. For most of his life, Meng Haoran was relatively uncelebrated and unknown. But once he made it to the big city, Chang'an, all the literati of the day were instantly enamored with his poetry. He was recommended to Emperor Xuanzong's court, but one of his poems that was presented, let's just say it was a little bit too controversial and what could have been, didn't happen. Late in life, around the age of 40, he did a short stint serving as a government official, but despite his efforts to join the civil bureaucracy, that wasn't the life for Meng Haoran. He chucked it all in and returned to his beloved Hubei province, the city of Xiangyang, up in the northwest corner of Hubei, bordering Shanxi and Henan. Xiangyang is one of those ancient and historic cities in China that's Bigger than Los Angeles, but I'm betting none of my fellow Americanskis have ever heard of it. When I visited the city in the 1990s, it was called Xiangfan. And right there, along the Han Shui, or Han River, Meng Haoran lived in nature and wrote poems that regarded nature. Along with Wang Wei, Meng was another of these pioneers in this landscape poetry, or Shan Shui Shi. Meng Haoran was grouped together with about half a dozen or so other poets who were called the Fields and Gardens Poet Group, Tian Yuan Shi Pai. The progenitor of this style of poetry was Tao Yuan Ming. He lived 4th, 5th century during the time of the Eastern Jin. 
And these later Tang poets who composed in this fields and garden style of poetry lionized Tao Yuanming and popularized his poems that focused on nature rather than people. So this fields and garden poetry as well as landscape poetry was something that started early but really exploded in popularity during the Tang and remained popular for centuries to follow. Both Wang Wei and Meng Hao Ran were the early masters of this kind of poetry in their day. Let's finish off this uh, episode with a few of Meng Hao Ran's poems. He left behind about 270 of them. If he produced any other literary works, nothing has turned up yet. And this first poem I'm going to read concerns Wang Wei. It's called Parting from Wang Wei, Liu Bie Wang Wei. These two were friends. I don't know how much time they spent together, but they, they certainly knew each other. And there's a story that says they met in 728 in Chang'an when both were serving as officials in the bureaucracy. It goes like this. Ji ji jing he dai. Chao chao kong zi gui. Yu xun fang cao qu. Xi yu gu ren wei. Dang lu shui xiang jia. Zhi ying shou ji mo. Huan yan gu yuan fei. Quietly, I've waited here so long. Day after day, but now I must return. Now I go to seek the fragrant grass, but I grieve to part from an old friend. Who is there who would help me on the road? Understanding friends are few in life. I should just observe my solitude and close again the gate of my old home. Here's another one of Meng Hao Ran's better known poems that falls into the landscape poetry category. This is called Mooring on the River at Jiande, Su Jiande Jiang. Yi zhou po yan zhu, ri mu ke chou xing, ye kuang tian di shu, jiang qing yue jing ren. My boat is moored near an isle in misty gray. I'm grieved anew to see the parting day. On boundless plain, trees seem to scrape the sky. In water clear, the moon appears so nigh. And one last nature poem of Meng Hao Ran. It's called A Spring Morning, Chun Xiao. Chun Mian Bu Jue Xiao. Chu Chu Wen Ti Niao. Ye Lai Feng Yu Sheng Hua Luo Zhi Duo Shang. In spring I sleep, unaware morning is here. From far and near, trilling songbirds I hear. In the night's pitter-patter of wind and rain, how many flowers fallen, not few, I fear. So, Meng Hao Ran and Wang Wei, two more greats from this high Tang period of Chinese classical poetry. There were others, of course, besides these ones discussed in the past few episodes, but... If you somehow have a newfound appreciation for Tang poetry, these are all the go-to guys to start with. As I mentioned before, the Chen Tang Shi, the complete book of Tang poetry, lists works from over 2,200 poets. Plenty to keep you busy if you want to dive in head first. In the next episode, we are going to move on to the Middle Tang, or Zhong Tang, period. This is where we will get to Bai Ju Yi, Xue Tao, and others. We'll see how many we can squeeze in before the final whistle. So, until that time, this here is once again Laszlo Montgomery, the proprietor of this joint, bringing you Chinese history and culture from the bottom of my heart. If you haven't guessed, I'm signing off from the town of Los Angeles, California, and I'm really hoping that you'll consider joining me in a mere two weeks' time for another poetic episode of the China History Podcast.